It is now time for oral questions. I recognize the Leader of Her Majesty's Loyal Opposition. Thank you so much, uh, Speaker. Speaker, my first question this morning is for the Premier. Uh, yesterday, Alberta signed the deal for a $10 a day childcare with the federal government, and families here in Ontario are asking what's, what's happening here in this province. Does the government not get the urgency here that families actually need a break, and $10 a day childcare would be a great break? Costs of everything are going up. I think everybody acknowledged that, acknowledges that. Child care expenses are one of the biggest that families have, sometimes costing more than the mortgage. Federal Minister yesterday uh, said this, and I quote, uh, we are still waiting on that action plan, and while I very much welcome the letter from Mr. Le Minister Lecce, we're still waiting for more details from the province of Ontario. Why has Ontario still not done their homework at leaving families to wait even longer. Why do we not have that child care deal right now? Question. Respond, the Minister of Education. Uh, well, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the member opposite for the question. Indeed, Ontario wants to get a good deal, a fair deal for the families that we serve. And Mr. Speaker, the offer by the federal government would not get us to $10 a day, not in year one, not in year five, not at any point in the duration of that agreement. And I would hope every member of this legislature is resolved to stand up for families who want a deal that gets us to $10, a fair share that reflects the interests of families and the fact that this province has one of the most comprehensive childcare systems in the world, in this country, no doubt, and we're proud of that, including the $3.6 billion we expend for 260,000 four- and five-year-olds. We want that recognized by the federal government. We want an investment that does not penalize Ontario because we happen to have the most progressive, comprehensive system in the nation. We want a better deal that is sustainable, that is flexible, and that truly achieves the objective Response. of the federal mandate, which is $10 a day for all families in this province. Supplementary question. Speaker, yesterday the government was spinning something like $21 or $22 an hour, and they're so out of touch that they don't realize that would immediately reduce costs by about 50 percent for families right here in, in this city and around the province. It would reduce significantly. So we know that childcare is not just about children and families. It's also about the economy, especially on the heels of this pandemic, where many, many women still have not returned to work. The Centre for Future uh, Work says this, a childcare deal could create literally thousands thousands of jobs and increase the GDP significantly. More importantly, it helps young children to succeed. That is the evidence-based reality about what child care offers, Speaker. So why does this government not understand that, that helping young families afford a quality life here in, a, in an increasingly unaffordable Ontario should be a priority. Why is the Premier Question. still refusing to bring a $10 a day affordable child care plan to this province? Minister of Education. Thank you, Speaker. The Premier is very committed to affordable child care. It's why in the first budget we unveiled the Ontario Child Care Tax Credit, which provides roughly $1,500 per child in savings, a measure that was opposed each and every year by the Democrats and Liberals in this House. But with that said, Speaker, we know there's more that can be done. The federal government contributes roughly 2.5 per cent of Ontario's contribution to child care. They should be doing much, much more. Now, we agree that child care is expensive. It's an inherited legacy of the former Liberals, roughly 40 per cent higher than the national average here in Ontario. Ontario. That's absolutely unacceptable. We agree. It's why we're at the table with the feds. It's why we've made the case that we're being shortchanged. And I thought the New Democrats, at least, would want to stand up to the Justin Trudeau Liberals to say, look, Ontarians are being shortchanged. Billions of dollars that will not lead us to $10 a day. That's the commitment the federal government made. That's what we expect of them, to invest in a program Response. that delivers a sustainable, flexible, long-term, affordable plan that all families could enjoy and, more importantly, all families could benefit from. The final supplementary. With all due respect, who New Democrats stand up for is the families who desperately need affordable childcare in this province. That's who we stand up for, Speaker. You know, I don't disagree with the minister that, in fact, the childcare system was broken under the Liberals. After 15 years, they did nothing to fix it. But what we need is a fix that makes it affordable for families. A need, uh, what we need is a fix that increases accessibility making sure we have more spaces for families to be able to put children into childcare. We need high-quality care with decently paid workers to make sure that care stays high quality. These are the fixes that this province needs. The question is, why won't this government 
actually get its act together and bring $10 a day childcare to uh, families in Ontario who continue to struggle with the rising costs of Question. everything. When will the government prioritize childcare? Speaker? Again, to reply, the Minister of Education. Mr. Speaker, we're putting the priority on Ontario families that expect their MPPs in this House to stand up for the best possible deal possible. It's an abdication of leadership for the members opposite to want us to sign any deal, the first deal that comes to the province, that would have ensured a short change of billions of dollars. That just seems inconceivable when we were sent here to stand up for the provincial interests. I didn't expect the leader of the NDP to be the champion for the federal Liberals. I expected her and every member of this House to say to the federal government, we want a better deal, one that actually invests in the children of this province, a comprehensive system that is more sustainable and more flexible, and a program that actually gets us to $10 a day, not $21 or $43 a day. That's not what they committed to. We want a commitment that is long-term, not a five-year program that creates short-term savings, no doubt, but long-term challenges for families. We want the feds to be at the table and stand with Spons? the province through a program that is sustainable, that is flexible, and that truly delivers on their commitment of affordable childcare for all families in Ontario. Thank you. The next question, once again, the Leader of the Opposition. Thank you very much, Speaker. My uh, next question is also for the Premier. You know, yesterday afternoon, this government voted against making life more affordable for Ontarians. So it's not surprising that they don't care about getting that childcare deal to take the burden off of families. Not only are they totally out of touch with how hard it is for everyday folks to build the life that they're, that they're working towards, but this government is making it absolutely worse. Low-wage policies, high High housing costs, the price of everything going through the roof, auto insurance, hydro, food. Now they're polling. They're polling on how to politically take advantage of a housing crisis that's been unfolding in this province for years now. The Liberals ignored it. The PCs are making it worse. Will this Premier stop polling on housing and actually help people to be able to afford a roof over their head in this province? Minister of Finance. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the member opposite uh, for the question. Of course, uh, I, I would submit that 760,000 Ontarians who received a minimum wage increase to $15 uh, an hour is something that uh, makes their lives more affordable. Mr. Speaker, that's over $1,300 for those at the minimum wage. That's over $5,000 for a liquor server, Mr. Speaker, I think if you talk to the three quarters of a million workers in this province who face every single day uh, prices going up, there's no question about that. Uh, and it's something that we're always very concerned about. But this government is very focused on helping the workers in this province and helping they who help us build this province into a more prosperous province for all families and for all Ontarians. Thank you. The supplementary question. Well, Speaker, in fact, this government's low-wage policies make it harder and harder for people to afford to put a, a roof over their head. But instead of trying to fix the problem, this government continues to poll on what it is that needs to be done with the housing crisis. The Premier shouldn't need to poll to understand that we are in an extremely problematic housing price crisis everywhere in the entire province. In Mississauga, single-family home is now $1.4 million. In Hamilton, the average average condo price is 577000 You can't even get a house in this city, in Toronto, for less than a million bucks. Why will the Premier stop worrying about himself and his political advantage, or future for that matter, and actually focus on making life more affordable in Ontario for people who are trying to pay the mortgage or even just have a roof over their Question. head? Mr. Municipal Affairs and Housing to respond. Thanks, uh, thanks Speaker. Uh, driven by a severe shortage of housing supply, rental housing and affordable housing has become unattainable for many Ontarians. And despite uh, all of the efforts by the government as part of our housing supply action plan, despite all of the improvements we've seen in terms of housing starts, construction starts, rental housing starts, we know as a government uh, that there is much, much more we can do. And as the finance minister said, uh, in his fall economic statement, we will be appointing in the near future a housing affordability task force to give us further suggestions to build upon the success that our housing supply action plan moves forward. I'll have more details in the near future, Speaker. Thank you for the question. The final supplementary. 
Speaker, I invite the minister to look at our housing policy, which we put out over a year ago now, because we knew that Ontarians need some hope in terms of the, house, uh, the, uh, the rising house costs in this province. But look, those costs are going through the roof, and the Premier continues to keep wages low in the meanwhile. Canada Real Estate Association forecasts that Ontario's average house, Ontario's average house will skyrocket to $942,000 in 2022, and that's almost a quarter of a million higher than in 2020, a quarter of a million dollars more in a matter of two years. Everyday Ontarians can't even afford to get into a home. They're struggling to make their mortgage payments. 37,000 people left this province, the greatest number in 30 years. They abandoned an unaffordable Ontario. The Premier is busy, instead of fixing this crisis, he's busy polling on what might be popular for Question. him politically. How can the Premier stick to this wrong-headed, low-wage policy when everything, especially the cost of the fundamental need that everyone has, the price of housing, is getting out of control and going through the roof? Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing. Thanks, Speaker. Despite COVID-19, housing starts are still up significantly since the pandemic. In fact, the housing sector invested over $25.6 billion in new housing in 2020, which is about $4.5 billion more uh, than the previous year. Right in the leader of the opposition's uh, city of Hamilton, housing starts in 2020 were up 7 per cent over uh, 2019, and year-to-date in 2021 show that they're currently 30 38 per cent higher. I acknowledge, Speaker, in the previous answer that there is much more to do. Order. Our government, again, is going to be building upon the success of our Housing Supply Action Plan. We're not done yet, Speaker. The next question, the member for Spadina, Fort York. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Health. November is Diabetes Awareness Month, and we know that the Minister of Health knows about it because she tweeted about it, but does she also know that diabetes is the leading cause of blindness in Canada? And that's why it's so important that people like people with type 1 diabetes, like Thomas Young and Jacob, who are Spadina Fort York constituents, can get an eye exam. But they haven't been able to get an eye exam because of this government's unwillingness to negotiate a fair deal with Ontario's optometrists. Ontario's children and seniors are also not able to get the eye care that they need, including the seven-year-old daughter of Jug Beer, who needs her first prescription glasses so that she can read the chalkboard at school. And seniors, including Gita Schwartz, Rob Whalen, Myrna Copeland, Candy Gill, and her husband, who are experiencing vision loss. In fact, it has been 77 days since anyone, in, since anyone has been able to receive OHIP-covered eye exams. So will the government stop spinning excuses truly value our residents' health and eyesight and enter Question. into good faith bargaining to achieve a fair deal with Ontario's optometrists. Minister of Health. Well, I can certainly agree with the member with his question that it is very concerning that many young people are not receiving the treatment that they need, and many seniors aren't as well. But that is not because the government is not paying for these OHIP-covered services. We continue to pay for them. The fact of the matter is that the Ontario Association of Optometrists has decided not to provide these services. They are demanding certain outcomes before we even start into negotiations. They broke off the negotiations with the mediator of their choice. They asked for $39 million in back payments because their previous agreement ran out in 2011 under the previous government. We want to make things right with them. We paid that $39 million into their account. They've asked for an increase going forward on the same basis that uh, physicians would receive. We are offering that at 8.48 per cent retroactive Response. to April 1st of this year, and we want to go into negotiations negotiations with them to discuss their overhead costs. These are all things that they've asked for. These are all things that we're willing to discuss. We ask them to come Thank you. And this supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The government continues to give excuses like the 8.48 per cent that they just mentioned, which would increase funding to $48 per exam. But an independent audit says that they need at least $75 per exam just to cover their costs without actually the optometrists being paid. The government says they are open to negotiations, but they refuse to even offer cost recovery funding to restart those negotiations. My leader, the leader of the official opposition NDP and the president of the Association of Optometrists both wrote to the minister last week asking for a fair deal. Even a member of the government's own caucus publicly admitted the government uses quote-unquote heavy-handed tactics and quote-unquote opted to ignore this important file. 
When will the government stop spinning excuses and negotiate a fair deal so that Spadina Fort York optometrists like Dr. Deepak Malkani, Dr. Shannon Fernandez, Question. Dr. Melissa Yoon, Dr. Mario Santos, and Dr. Abraham Yoon can get back to doing what they want to do, what they were trained to do, which is to assist people with their eye care? Minister Paul. Well, the fact of the matter is our government is very anxious for optometrists to continue providing these services to people under 18, to people over 65, and everyone else in between. But the, we are, have offered to go back to the table. The mediator has set out some terms that he wants to see abided by in order for the media, uh, arbitration to continue. We've agreed to do that. We have agreed with all of those conditions, but the optometrists have not. We want to make sure that we can cover as many of their costs as possible, but we need to see what their overhead costs are to do our proper due diligence as custodians of public funds. We want to reach a deal that's going to be fair to the taxpayers of Ontario and fair to the optometrists. We want to put a group together to work with the optometrists to look into these issues. So all we need at this point, because we are ready, willing and able to pursue those negotiations, we need the optometrists to come back to the table. So if you're speaking Spons. with those optometrists, would you please ask their association to go back to the table so we can complete a deal and make sure everyone receives the eye care that they need in the province of Ontario. I remind the members to uh, make a comments through the chair. The next question, the member for Scarborough, Rouge Park. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Colleges and Universities. Speaker, as you are well aware, the COVID-19 pandemic has emphasized the importance of research. Conducting research here at home would allow Ontario to discover, commercialize, and advance technologies and remain competitive. Additionally, research leads to the creation of new knowledge and insight, which can bring high quality change to society. So, Speaker, through you to the Minister, what is this Minister and the government doing to keep Ontario competitive in research and innovation? To respond, the Minister of Colleges and Universities. Mr. Speaker, Mr. Member, Rouge Park for that important question. Our government is committed to investing in research and innovation in order to compete and thrive in the global economy. The Ontario government in the fall economic statement is investing an additional $48 million over two years to support groundbreaking research initiatives across the province, from London to Kingston to Sudbury and beyond. Funding will go to support the work being done at the Perimeter Institute, Snow Lab and Advanced, Compute Advanced Research Computing Facilities. These initiatives will put Ontario at the forefront of innovation and ensure that research and research infrastructure continues to be competitive to attract the best and brightest researchers to this province. Ontario is committed to supporting research to advance new discoveries and innovation, foster a skilled Response. labour force, and promote new business opportunities across the province. Supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the Minister for the answer. It is great to hear that our government is investing in the future of research here at home in Ontario. Mr. Speaker, when we think about the research, we think about the knowledge, data, and information. It is essential for Ontario's research institutes and post-secondary institutions to discover, commercialize, and adapt advanced technologies to remain competitive. Speaker, through you, can the minister tell us how this funding will benefit Ontario's research institutes and post-secondary institutions and our province as a whole? Mr. Colleges and University. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the member for your interest in this exciting initiative. Mr. Speaker, it is essential for Ontario's research and institutes and post-secondary institutions to discover, commercialize, and adopt advanced technologies to remain competitive. Advanced technologies have the potential to increase productivity and create new revenue opportunities to deliver high-quality products and services. This, in turn, helps create highly skilled jobs and enhances the global competitiveness of Ontario's companies. Our government is saying yes to investing in research to solve complex problems. This research will lead us to addressing climate change, improving cybersecurity, or finding cures for cancer right here in Ontario. Our government is thrilled to see this $48 million investment to support research excellence to support key research initiatives. I'd like to Response. thank the Perimeter Institute for hosting me last week. Uh, Ramil Sonadaram from Compute Ontario 
and Dr. Virtue from Snow Lab, who drove five hours from Sudbury to join us. Thank you. The next question, the member for Toronto, Dan Ford. Thank you, Speaker. Speaker to the Minister of Indigenous Relations. Yesterday, Grassy Narrows First Nation announced they're pursuing legal action against Ontario for issuing, issuing mining exploration permits which authorize companies to drill for gold on their territory. In a statement, Chief Randy Fobister said it very clearly, the government isn't working with us, they are working against us. They need to stop logging and mining so the land can heal. Good land will heal our people from all the damage the government has been pushing on us, like mercury and industry. Will the government listen to the leadership at Grassy Narrows and rescind those permits? The parliamentary assistant, member for Peterborough Kawartha. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. What's been issued has been exploration permits, and I could arrange a briefing for the member if he'd like to have a better understanding of what the difference is between the types of permits. The Crown has a duty to consult the Aboriginal commu communities in relation to approval for mining exploration. Our government takes the challenges faced by the people of Grousey and Narrows very, very seriously, and we are engaging in conversation with them. But because this matter has now come before the courts, I'm afraid that I'm not able to discuss anything further about it. And the supplementary question. Speaker, the government did not consult or even notify the people of Grassy Narrows before issuing these permits. Not consult, not even notify. But now the people of Grassy Narrows know what's going on. They are being perfectly clear. Chief Officer went on to say, since Premier Ford came into power, there has been a huge expansion of mining claims and permits on our territory. And now the government is starting to plan for more industrial logging on part of our territory again. How many times must our people fight off these attacks on our health and on our way of life? Speaker, the community is being very clear about their needs. Why won't the government listen? The end of the the will please take your seat. Member for Peterborough Kawartha. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The ministry continues to work with Grassy Narrows to establish a positive relationship and promote reconciliation and to ensure that the community is appropriately consulted regarding proposals to resource development in the area. We actually have a meeting scheduled with them for Thursday of this week. But because the matter is before the courts, it would be inappropriate for me to comment any further. Order. The next question, the member for York Centre. Good morning, Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Health. For more than a year, the government was telling Ontarians that vaccination is the way out of the pandemic. Ontarians endured measures, lockdowns, and mandates. They're now subjected to segregation and passports. But alas, Speaker, the goalpost is moving again. Over the last week, we've heard from Dr. Isaac Bogosh, who advised the government on its vaccine rollout. Bogosh confirmed yesterday that efficacy of the vaccine is reduced after six months, which is why Ontario is rolling out boosters. And last week, Bogosh tweeted that the vaccine is just a helpful tool providing incremental benefit. My question to the Minister of Health. As almost 90% of Ontarians are fully vaccinated, does she still believe that the vaccine is the way out? And if so, why aren't we out? To reply, the Deputy Premier and Minister of Health. Well, this is a pandemic. I hope the member realizes that. We're not in the endemic stage of it yet. We do have over 88.6% of our adults age 12 and over who have received the first dose, 85.6%. We're well on our way to reaching the 90% strategy that we've been aiming for. We're working on our last mile strategy right now. In the meantime, compared to many countries in the world, uh, you will have noticed that hundreds, over 5 million people have died from this pandemic around the world right now. We are, with this role of vaccination, we are saving lives. And 
for people who are doubly vaccinated who also can still contract COVID. It's going to save their life because it will mean that they will not have nearly as toxic a case. They will largely be out of hospitals. And as you can see by the numbers, even Fonts. though we have gone up in numbers as we expected with the colder weather company, coming, this was not unanticipated. We currently have only 137 people in our intensive care units right now, which includes 11 people from Saskatchewan. Well, thank you. A supplementary question. Speaker, the government moved the goalpost again. Maybe the Minister of Health was just kidding when for the last 12 months she was telling us that the vaccines are the way out. Public health is making it up as it goes along. Speaker, it's a new virus, it's a new vaccine, which is why we need to start having frank conversations instead of censorship by the COVID mob. From two weeks to flatten the curve to... Okay. Ask the member to withdraw. Withdrawn. What is question? From two weeks to flatten the curve to slow the spread. From slow the spread to stop the spread. From stop the spread to 70% vaccinated, then 85% vaccinated. Now we're at 90% vaccinated. But on Sunday on CTV, head of the science table, Dr. Juni, said that we need two weeks to flatten the curve. Did Juni mean to be funny? My question to the Minister of Health. 90% of us are vaccinated. If the vaccine is effective and is the way out, then why do we need another two weeks to flatten the curve? And to reply again, Minister of Health. Thank you. Hard to know where to start with this one, but let's just start with, I don't know who the Order. member has been speaking with, with as to uh, medical evidence here, but the vaccine has been recommended by the World Health Organization, by the Food and Drug Administration in the U.S., by Health Canada, by the National Advisory Committee on Immunization. It has been proven to be effective in saving people's lives. It's not the only factor. There are many other things that we need to do, such as wearing masks, which is what we're doing here today, such as maintaining physical distancing, frequent hand washing, adequate ventilation. All of these things are important. It's not just one single thing. But out of all of these issues, vaccination is the most important issue. That's why it is fundamentally important for us to get to 90% vaccination rate in Ontario Spons? so that we can then start to see this as an endemic rather than a pandemic. But we are not out of this yet. I urge everyone who's not received a vaccination yet, please do so. It will save your life. Thank you very much. The next question, the member for Halliburton, Kawartha Lakes Broad. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Community, Children and Social Services. Our province has come a long way in the fight against COVID-19, thanks to our frontline workers, nurses and health care providers across the province. Although the end of COVID is in sight, we cannot yet take it for granted. Some of Ontario's most vulnerable populations live in congregate care settings, including homes for adults and developmental disabilities, shelters, children residential settings, youth justice facilities, and Indigenous residential programs. These populations are disproportionately affected by COVID-19 and require more support than you or I. So, Mr. Speaker, my question is, how is this government continuing to support frontline workers and some of this government's most important uh, vulnerable citizens? Minister of Children, Community and Social Services. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the member from Halliburton, Kawartha Lakes, Brock, uh, for your good work on behalf of your constituents. Since the onset of the pandemic, our government took immediate steps, immediate action to protect our province's most vulnerable people and the frontline staff who care for them in residential settings. This government understands that the fight against COVID is not over. And that's why, as announced in the fall economic statement, we are continuing to respond to the COVID-19 pandemic. We are taking further action to protect Ontario's most vulnerable populations and ensure the safety of those in congregate care settings, including homes for adults with develop developmental disabilities, shelters, children's residential settings, youth justice facilities, Indigenous residential programs, with an additional investment of $8.9 million in 2021-22. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you for the question. And the supplementary question. Well, thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the Minister of Children, Community and Social Services for her answer and her dedication to this file and for explaining the government's action in supporting our vulnerable populations. 
My question is back to the minister. I appreciate that the government has adapted with the evolving science to meet the situation throughout the pandemic and followed the advice and guidance of the Chief Medical Officer of Health. This additional investment is necessary to ensure the health and safety of those in congregate care, both for residents and their care providers. In these extraordinary times, it has become clear that COVID-19 must be stopped at the doors of congregate settings through the measures like enhanced screening and use of PPE. My question, Mr. Speaker, is what can the minister tell us what the additional investment will mean to residents and caregivers in congregate care? Minister of Children, Community and Social Services, once again. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you again to uh, um, our good member from uh, Kawartha Lakes, Brock. Thank you. Our government is building on the previous investments of $131 million, with an additional investment of $8.9 million in 2021 22 for COVID 19 supports in congregate care settings to ensure the province's most vulnerable and those who care for them are safe. This funding will help to provide support such as personal protective equipment, infection prevention and control measures, and HEPA filters to improve ventilation, which is increasing in its importance. These supports will help reduce transmission of the virus and allow residents and staff to be better protected against COVID-19. Our government recognizes that we have come a long way in combating COVID-19 and we are committed to continuing all of our efforts Spons? until COVID-19 is curbed. Thank you for the question. Thank you. The member for Algoma, Manitoulin. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Premier. My office received a letter from the CEO of Central Manitoulin explaining that they are facing a shortage of volunteer firefighters who have not who have a valid deed license. Their issue isn't the lack of willing volunteers. They have people ready to go. The issue is that they aren't able to schedule a road test until April 2022 due to testing backlog. People in my writing can't wait five months to have a fully staffed fire department. They need to know that when there is an emergency, they will be, there will be someone ready to respond right away. The drive test backlog has gone on long enough, and the government needs to take action now. One extra examiner isn't going to make a dent in the demands we are facing in the North. Will the Premier commit now Question. to open new drive test locations in the North and allocation of resources necessary to end the backlog across this province? Thank you. The Minister of Transportation to respond. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the member opposite for the question. Uh, I understand the frustration of Ontarians across the province uh, in accessing drive, test, uh, drive tests uh, in every part of the province, in the north, in the south. That's why in June I introduced an aggressive plan, Mr. Speaker, with a committed investment of over $16 million to tackle the backlog of in-vehicle passenger road tests and to ensure that everyone who can get it who needs a test can book one as part of this plan we've opened over 9 temporary road test facilities and we're hiring an additional 251 examiners that are offering road tests with extended hours on weekends and weekdays Mr. Speaker, just recently we all opened three additional temporary uh, road test facilities, and we are looking at adding one additional road test, drive test examiner in every location in the north. Mr. Speaker, we know how important this is to all Ontarians. We have a province-wide plan to deal with, with the drive test backlog, but we ask for Ontarians' patience. Thank you. Supplementary question. Again, my question to the Premier. Ruth, let me try again. This is question period, not answer period, and I do apologize. This town, CAO writes, our volunteer firefighters are having great difficulty. When a call comes in, they are not enough qualified drivers for the fire truck. We have some qualified drivers, but since it's our volunteer force, they are not always available or in the area to respond to every call. The situation cannot go on. Speaker, this is a vital emergency service that the town cannot go on. This is not unique 
two Algoma Manitoulin municipalities. People's health and welfare is at stake because the Premier continues to ignore rural and northern communities. Will the Premier recognize that he is Question. failing people in rural communities and urgently address the growing drive test backlog with additional testing locations in the north? Mr. Transportation. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Well, look, the problem in the north didn't happen overnight. The government, our government is tackling the road test backlog that COVID-19 created. But the north has historically faced capacity challenges that predate the pandemic and that certainly predate this government. These issues were the result of neglect by the previous Liberals, who had 15 years to increase testing capacity in the North but couldn't get it done. Mr. Speaker, we have an aggressive plan in place, I, we, and we are by no means leaving Northerners behind when it comes to our aggressive strategy to tackle the backlog. I am aware of the specific issues in the Algoma Drive Test Centre, and we are looking at specific responses to it, Mr. Speaker, and I can commit to the member opposite that we can be in touch and talk about what our approach will be. Thank you. Thank you. The next question, the member for Ottawa, Vanier. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Environment, Conservation and Parks. Mr. Speaker, earlier this month, international activists and political leaders met at COP26 in Glasgow to talk about commitment to reducing emissions. Ontarians were excited. They thought, well, maybe this is it. Maybe we will finally know how this government will join the rest of the country in fighting climate change. Ontario's, Ontarians paid to send our Minister of Environment to COP26, but the Premier sent him empty-handed. We know that, Mr. Speaker, because we've heard nothing from the Minister about the conference or the work he did over there. Climate change conferences are not paid vacations. These conferences are essential work sessions to coordinate efforts against this existential threat. So my question is, what is the minister's justification for going to COP26, and what work did he do Question. to Ivan advance climate action? The Minister of Environment, Conservation and Parks. Thank you, Speaker. Uh, the member is indeed incorrect. I was honoured to be a part of the Canadian delegation at the COP conference where I spoke at length and with a number of different stakeholders about the important work Ontario is doing to cl tackle climate change. The member opposite would know, in fact, that Ontario leads Canada in greenhouse gas reductions. Mr. Speaker, it's thanks to investments that, in part, that this government's made into transportation, record investments into subways, record investments into expanding GO Transit, Mr. Speaker, fuel additives that are are going to reduce greenhouse gas emissions equivalent to taking approximately 300,000 cars off the road. We met with a number of delegations about our hydrogen strategy that Ontario is launching, our climate change impact assessment, the first of its kind in Canada to build uh, resiliency to fight climate change. We spoke at length with a number of other provinces keen to learn about Ontario's experiences. Ron, speaker. Response? I will uh, follow up a little more with detailed meetings in the supplementary, but was honoured to be a part of Canada's delegation to fight climate change. Thank you, Speaker. <laughs> supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, but nothing of that was share, shared during the conference, and we're still wondering what happened there. Mr. Speaker, this government has demonstrated their lack of commitment to climate action by spending Ontarians' tax dollars in efforts to make polluting free. One of the first things the government did was cancel the cap-and-trade program after companies had already bought into it. I was expecting applause for that. The direct impact of this backtracking by this government is that millions of tons of additional carbon have been emitted since 2018. The government spent $30 million fighting the federal carbon tax in court and $4 million in advertising campaign to convince Ont Ontarians that climate change is not important. Now the government is selling off the green belt to wealthy developers and using MZOs to strip away the role of conservation authority and bypass environmental question. laws. So my question is, does this government think it should be free to pollute in Ontario? Mercy environment, conservation and parks. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I think it's important uh, to understand the facts. That 
member is a part of a party who, when in government, could have expanded the use of clean fuels. They didn't. That, that government could have learned from the COP conference in Paris and launched a climate change impact assessment to build adaptation and resiliency. They didn't. They could have built subways and encouraged Ontarians to take active transportation through subways, through expanding GO trains. They didn't. They could have expanded green space. They could have added more parks. They could have expanded more wetlands. They didn't. Speaker, they could have invested in green bonds, over $7.7 billion that this government's invested in green bonds. They didn't. When I was at COP, I spoke to Tamar Zandberg about the important work in wastewater that Shaftan's doing in Israel to inform the important legislation I introduced on York, an ever-growing community. They say no to highways. They say no to wastewater, improving wastewater management in uh, the province of Ontario, Mr. Speaker. We met, uh, we met with an important roundtable on electric vehicles. Again, that government could have built manufacturing and attract. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. The next question, the member for Oakville. Yeah, thank you, Speaker. And uh, my question is to the uh, Minister of Agriculture, Food and Rural Affairs. Mr. Speaker, throughout COVID, agri-food businesses experienced unexpected costs to protect the health and safety of employees. Other agri-food businesses have experienced labor challenges that have disrupted their operations and our food processing and supply chains. Food Processing Skills Canada projects a shortfall in full-time food processing jobs will reach 65,000 across Canada by 2025. And according to the Canada Agricultural Human Resources Council, Canada will face a shortage of 123,000 workers by 2029, with the majority of that shortfall here in Ontario. Mr. Speaker, to the Minister of Agricultural Food and Rural Affairs, what is our government doing to address these shortfalls and help grow this valuable sector of our economy? Recognize the Minister of Agriculture, Food and Rural Affairs. Thank you very much, Speaker, and I appreciate the question from the hardworking member at Oakville because the incredible jobs that exist in the agri-food sector are right here in the GTHA and across small town of rural Ontario. And our government, with the Premier Ford at the lead, is working so hard to make sure that we are taking the right steps and growing investments to make sure people understand the incredible opportunities that exist within this sector. Just last month, our government announced through the Canadian Agricultural Partnership that Canada, together with Ontario, is investing $1.5 million to address some of our province's agri-food sector labour challenges. And, Speaker, this investment will build a strong labour force that will support projects that identify and address labour challenges that we are currently facing. And I can tell you, Speaker, Spons? with absolute certainty that we have a sector that wants to work with our government because they trust and believe in what we're doing when it comes to Great jobs growing in the agri-food sector in Ontario. Supplementary question. Thank you, and Mr. Speaker. It's great to hear that this government is uh, taking concrete steps to respond to the agri-food industry's labour shortage. However, while an aging workforce is part of the issue, we also know that the reason for the shortage is a result of the specific challenges in attracting entry-level and experienced skilled workers to jobs and careers in that particular sector. So, Mr. Speaker, to the Minister of Agriculture, Food and Rural Affairs, what is the government doing to address the skills gap in Ontario's agri-food industry? Agriculture, Food and Rural Affairs. Thank you, Speaker. You know, prior to COVID-19, the pandemic, the agri-food sector in Ontario had over 720,000 workers, and we hear day in and day out. I'll start that one again. We hear day in and day out now on a regular basis that people are looking for people to fill the job shortages that we have in this industry, and we're working so hard to attract young people and adults with transferable skills to this particular sector. You know, we are looking at opportunities that will provide well-paying careers, and that includes innovation, technology, STEM, automation, uh, robotics, and the Minister of Colleges and Universities are working very hard with the Minister of Labour with regards to increasing awareness of the amazing trades that are available through this sector, but there's professional Spons? positions as well. And I can tell you, the, the chair of Agscape, who Agscape is agriculture in the classroom, promoting good quality jobs. She was speaking to the Premier and I can tell you that commodity organizations, industries like Food and Beverage Ontario, and our government will work. Thank you very much. 
Thank you. The next question, the member for Ottawa Centre. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Premier. After being out of service for almost two months due to a sixth train derailment, the Ottawa LRT resumed partial service last Friday. But, Speaker, public confidence in our LRT has been plagued with issues from the start, and the public's confidence remains at an all-time low. For over a year, I've been insisting with this government that they take action and address the mess. I have heard it's the City of Ottawa's problem, until very recently. Late last week, the Minister of Transportation—good morning, Minister— said the government is considering options to promote accountability, including a judicial inquiry and an Ontario Auditor General investigation that I've been requested. Speaker, residents in Ottawa are fed up. They want answers, and they deserve accountability. So, my question to the Premier, will he call, mandate a provincial judicial question. inquiry under the Municipal Act and join us here in the official opposition by asking the Auditor General of Ontario to conduct an investigation into this mess? And to reply, the Minister of Transportation. Mr. Speaker, well, um, as members of this House know well, getting transit built in Ontario is a priority for our government, and we must build with respect for transit riders and for taxpayers. I am frustrated with the challenges that have plagued Stage 1 of the Ottawa LRT, and we become increasingly concerned with the city's ability to successfully carry out future phases of this work. Ontario is a funding partner. And it's important that we have confidence in the city to deliver, especially given the size and the scope of stage two. We've also heard from industry stakeholders and city councillors who've expressed concern about the execution of phase one. So we are looking at options that will increase the province's oversight of the project to ensure the best value for taxpayer dollars moving forward. All options are on the table, Mr. Speaker. This may include a judicial review, a review by Ontario's Auditor General, and further measures that may require provincial legislation. The supplementary question. It's encouraging to hear that this morning, Speaker, but I can honestly tell you, and I'll tell the Minister through you, that there are some people in Ottawa that do not want a judicial review. Lobbyists and insiders, Speaker, are worried like Mr. Brian Guest, a major LRT consultant who told former Ottawa Mayor Bob Shirelli in an email that a judicial inquiry would, and these are his words, Speaker, screw him. Those were his words, Speaker, released to the media by Mr. Shirelli, but that's not the worst of it. It actually gets worse, Speaker. Mr. Guest's company is still involved in the planning and procurement of major Metrolink's P3 projects, including the Ontario Line. So, Speaker, Despite the government's rhetoric around accountability today, which is welcome to hear, there actually at this point is no difference between Premier Ford and Mr. Del Duca when it comes to promoting P3s in public transit. This Premier has talked about stopping the gravy train, but like Mr. Del Duca, he appears to be just as devoted to the P3 gravy train that helps insiders like Mr. Guest. So again, my question to the Minister, to the Premier. Will a judicial inquiry mandated by Ontario be called? Will the Auditor General of Ontario investigate this mess to get to the bottom of this, to get our alert? Minister of Transportation. Mr. Speaker, well, as I've said, improving public transit is a priority for our government, which is why we committed $600 million for Stage 1 of the Ottawa LRT and up to $1.2 billion for Stage 2. But to ensure accountability of the project, Ontario is already holding back 10 per cent of the committed Phase 1 funding, as safety investigations remain ongoing and as our government is committed to standing up for taxpayers. This is about having full confidence that the city will be able to carry out future phases of work on this project and deliver for the people of Ottawa. As I said, Mr. Speaker, all options are on the table. Our government is reviewing those, and we'll have more to say in the future. Thank you. Next question, the member for York Centre. Thank you, Speaker. To the Minister of Labour, over the last two months, tens of thousands of Ontarians lost or have been suspended from their jobs. More companies are forcing workers to do something against their will. The minister claims he didn't vote against my jobs and jabs bill, but every time I ask him about it, tens of thousands of Ontarians losing their jobs, he refuses to even acknowledge the issue. But now we have a pivot, an admission by the experts that the vaccine doesn't prevent transmission and that its efficacy is reduced to six to eight months. My question to the Minister of Labour, is it appropriate to fire employees who choose not to vaccinate, given that the vaccine doesn't prevent transmission and its efficacy wanes after six to eight months? And to reply, the government house leader. 
Speaker. Well, it is, uh, it is important, as, as the Minister of Health has, has already highlighted, it is important that Ontarians uh, get vaccinated, Mr. Speaker. That is the way that we'll, uh, we will eventually uh, remove ourselves from this, uh, from this uh, pandemic, Mr. Speaker. It is also appropriate that employers uh, protect their, work, their workplaces and their, and their employees, Mr. Speaker. We will always protect those, uh, those workplaces and those employees and, uh, and support them in doing so, Mr. Speaker. The good news, of course, is that across Ontario, the economy is booming, Speaker, uh, and that has required us to aggressively look at other ways that we can fill these job vacancies across the province of Ontario. We're seeing the economy roar back to life, Mr. Speaker, uh, and, uh, and that is good news for all Ontarians. I hope that the member opposite will do like he used to do, Mr. Speaker, and when supporting us in all of those measures that we brought in in the, in the pandemic to keep Ontario safe. Response. He was a wonderful supporter of all of those measures, and I hope he'll be a great supporter in helping bring back the Ontario. Uh, Ontario economy as we uh, go forward. And the supplementary question. Speaker, the, this government is pretending that the catastrophe experienced by hundreds of thousands of Ontario workers isn't happening. They claim to stand up for workers, but thousands of Ontario families don't know if they can keep a roof over their head. And it's not because they aren't working, it's because they aren't allowed to work. Because in this government's Ontario, Employers can terminate you for cause if you refuse to take medication that doesn't prevent transmission and wanes after six months. My question to the Minister of Labour, given what we now understand about the limitations of the vaccine, will he show leadership? Will he show compassion? Will the government House leader show compassion and defend Ontario employees who are being fired for not wanting to do something against their will? Government House Leader. Mr. Speaker, this is a member who voted in support of every single measure that this government brought forward in order to fight the pandemic. Mr. Speaker, he got up in his place and voted yes to every single one of those measures at a time when we did not have a vaccine and when our numbers were increasing. Now, at a time when almost 90 percent of the people of the province of Ontario who are eligible have gotten vaccines, when, as the Minister of Health has talked about, numbers in our ICUs have decreased dramatically, our hospitals are back on the road to recover, people are getting their surgeries, our economy is booming, this member has decided that he's got a different approach, a unique approach, one that doesn't work anywhere, Mr. Speaker. The results are clear. Do you want to support workers? Do you want to keep people working? Then get vaccinated Spons? because that is the best way for us to continue to grow the economy and for us to move forward in the province of Ontario. Thank you. Thank you. The next question, the member for London West. Uh, thank you very much, Speaker. My question is to the Premier. Speaker, Brian Russell relies on ODSP and lives in a 125-unit townhouse complex on Belmont Drive in London West. Last month, tenants were told that the units will soon be sold and they will be forced out. Brian fears he won't find another place he can afford and worries he will become homeless. Another tenant, Amy Baker, says, we have all just barely survived coming out of COVID mentally and financially, and now this. She told me the scare tactics that they have set upon our community is disgusting, especially with winter approaching and not being able to find affordable housing. Speaker, speaker when is this government going to finally crack down on bad faith landlords who illegally pressure or coerce tenants to move out? Mr. Minister of Affairs and Housing. Thanks, uh, thanks Speaker, and thanks for the question. Um, I know that the Attorney General has worked hard uh, with the Landlord Tenant Board, ensuring uh, that staffing levels are, are up. Uh, as the member opposite knows, our government, uh, through uh, Bill 184, uh, protecting tenants and strengthening the Community Housing Act, uh, put a number of measures uh, in place uh, to further protect tenants. As the member knows, we also were one of the only jurisdictions in Canada that provided a, a rent freeze. Uh, in, uh, in 2021, but we know that there's much more work uh, that we can do uh, for tenants uh, as we encourage uh, tenants and landlords to continue to work together. Uh, I want, Speaker, through you to the member to know that if uh, your, those tenants in your riding are concerned uh, about uh, the law being broken, I would encourage them to reach out to my ministry, Spons? to the Rental Housing Enforcement Unit, uh, so that an investigation could take place. 
Thank you, Speaker. Yesterday, my office learned of another London West building where the same thing is happening. Catherine Peebles is a cancer survivor living on a disability pension at 425 Mackenzie. The building was recently sold, and the new property manager has approached the residents to get them to vacate their units. A few of these residents were told that if they didn't leave, it could become, quote, very uncomfortable for them. Speaker, London's 2021 Vital Signs reported almost 6,000 individuals and families in London are currently on the wait list for social housing, an increase of 1,000 since last year. More than 1,300 Londoners are experiencing homelessness. Speaker, when will this government get serious about preventing illegal evictions, protecting tenants, and investing Question. in the affordable housing that Londoners need? Minister Minister Again, uh, in terms of investing in, in affordable housing, this government, uh, through the Safe Restart Plan, has uh, put a, a record investment into our community housing system, over a billion dollars to our municipal partners, much of that not cost-shared by the federal government. I was the first minister uh, in uh, Canada to, uh, after the uh, federal um, cabinet was sworn in to go to Ottawa to meet with my federal colleague, and I made it crystal clear uh, to my federal colleague that Ontario, who is renegotiating our national housing strategy deal with them this year, we're shortchanged. $490 million uh, from the federal government based on our core housing need uh, in this province. $490 million could go a long way to help uh, community housing systems right across this, this, right across this province, including in the City of London. We will continue to stand up for tenants. We will continue Once. to stand up to get our fair share. What we need is other members like your party who consistently vote against our measures to support us. Sure, Speaker. Sure. Thank you very much. Next question, the member for Orléans. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Premier. Mr. Speaker, commuters need relief today, but instead it's reported that the government is choosing to give nearly a billion dollars away to the owners of Highway 407 without anything in return for commuters. Experts suggest that the reduction of tolls on the 407 could provide congestion relief, and yet the Premier and his government, uh, a government that likes to say yes, seems to have said no. They've said no to commuters, Mr. Speaker, by keeping 407 tolls amongst the highest in North America. Mr. Speaker, the government is choosing the destruction of thousands of acres of green space, forests, and farmland, Order. and they're choosing to spend $10 billion on a highway that won't be built for nearly a generation. Mr. Speaker, that's more gridlock, more damage to the environment, and of course, it's a billion dollars lost to corporate, give corporate giveaways. Mr. Speaker, why is the government more committed to billion dollar corporate bailouts than they are to Ontario commuters? Mr. Transportation. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Well, since our government took office, we have been focused on making life more affordable for all Ontarians. And in response to the COVID-19 pandemic, Mr. Speaker, we took specific action to address uh, affordability for commuters and for drivers. We suspended the collection of interest on unpaid toll fees from Highways 407 East, 412, and 418. We froze the scheduled increases to driver and carrier products, like driver's licenses and validation tags. We extended the validity of all government driver vehicle and carrier fees, and we froze the scheduled CPI increase to toll rates on highways 407 East, 412, and 418 that was scheduled to come into effect on June 1st. Mr. Speaker, in this case, our government was bound by a contractual agreement with the 407 ETR Corporation. It included a clause in the event that it could not meet traffic volume targets because of a pandemic. Bonds. Mr. Speaker, our government had to comply with the law and had no choice but to grant force majeure. Mr. Speaker, our government is committed to getting Ontarians moving and making sure that life is affordable as, as we do so. Thank you. And a supplementary question. Well, Mr. Speaker, lower tolls on the 407 would almost certainly divert traffic from other congested corridors and help families uh, save time. Now, it's been reported, and it sounds like the minister just confirmed, that they've recently granted the owners of 407 nearly a billion dollars in relief. Owners like SNC Lavalin, as an example. A billion dollars, Mr. Speaker. Now, a billion dollars might not be a lot of money to a government that has no plan to ever balance their budget, but it is a lot of money to Ontarians, Mr. Speaker. Now, the government claims the government claims to be using every tool at their disposal to address gridlock. But instead of negotiating lower tolls on the 407, they're giving away a billion dollars to corporate interests. Why? 
Minister of Transportation. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. It is truly ironic to hear the member from Orleans calling for lower tolls when it was the Del Duca Liberals who had imposed tolls on highways that they built, oh. making life harder and more expensive for drivers in Ontario. Mr. Speaker, Highway 407 is a privately operated company and as a result has full control over its toll rates. This has been the case since the contract was established in 1999. The Liberals had 15 years to renegotiate the contract, Mr. Speaker. Stephen Del Duca had four years as Minister of Transportation, and he did nothing. These were unprecedented circumstances, the and the member for Orleans is offside here. The Liberals had 15 years to remove tolls on provincial highways to address gridlock, but instead they did nothing. Affordability for Ontarians clearly was not a priority for Response? the Liberals, Mr. Speaker, but it is for us. We are constantly reviewing opportunities to lower the cost of living for hardworking families, and that includes the many costly policies that were enacted by the Del Duca Liberals. The next question. Speaker, my question is to the Minister of Education. It has been months since the federal government unveiled its $10 a day childcare plan. And since then, every province has been negotiating or has signed a deal to bring in $10 a day childcare except Ontario. And it's parents who are paying the price. People like Natalia, she's a nurse in my riding, and she has told me the cost of childcare makes everyday living extremely difficult for her and her family. With rent, school, debt, and the rising cost of living, she cannot afford it. Every day, your government delays in striking a deal with the federal government costs families. When will this government stop stalling and get us an agreement for affordable, high-quality, public or non-profit, $10 a day childcare? In response, the Minister of Education. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I know Natalia and all families in Ontario want to see $10 a day childcare. What the Liberal and New Democratic position is is that we should just take the first offer made by the uh, Trudeau government. And I would simply argue that for Natalia and for all families and moms and dads in Ontario, the deal on the table would not bring us anywhere near $10 a day. And it is, an, it is up to us as legislators to say to the federal government, advancing the provincial interest, that the deal offered falls short, does not get us a $10, is not sustainable, and more importantly, would lead to hikes in year five, six, and beyond. We are working hard to get a good deal and get our fair share from the federal government. We want a deal. We've been working with the federal government, of course, interrupted by the federal election. Response. Nonetheless, we're there now, making clear our objectives of affordability, of flexibility, and a sustainable program to lower its cost for all families right across Ontario. Thank you. That concludes our question period this morning. This House stands in recess until 3 p.m.